Well, wonderful good evening and welcome here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Right before the elections, uh, 2024, of course, we're talking about the European elections. I mean, there are also other elections that we are looking at um, and looking forward to this year. But we know that the elections to the European Parliament, of course, will be particularly important for us over the next weeks. And um, it is also going to be the most important one for the European citizens. I would like to welcome you all very cordially here, also our guests in the live stream. Here and also digitally, we will have English translation uh, for you available here in the room, but also online, so um, please follow us also on English. Europa gefällt mir nicht. I don't like Europe. So, wie es derzeit ist the way it is at the moment. I don't like Europe. And I know that it could be much better, that much could be done better than we have done so far in the European Union. This is why we should work on improving Europe. This is actually the prerequisite also in order to make progress in Europe. And of course, we all already have achieved a lot when it comes to Europe, and it's very important, um, and from an overall perspective, I already like it now, but from my experience in the European Parliament, I can say that there are many construction sites, so to speak, that are not yet finished and where we still have to continue to work on. What I've also experienced is that um, there are some prerequisites for the work on Europe for its further development, which first needs to be created. And to do that, we need major changes. Um, we have to look at the Lisbon Treaty, for example, which entered uh, into force at the time and changed um, the European Union and its workings and brought along also the Basic Rights Charter. Without this constitution framework and the Basic Rights Charter, a huge step that I was involved in, which is the um, data protection, um, the GDPR, would not have been possible. And so here the European Union has shown that it can set standards. So this was really a major step forward. The question of reforms and of treaties and what are the um, framework conditions are very important when we want to discuss progress in different political fields. And likewise, the enlargement of 2004, the eastward expansion and also the accession of Poland to the European Union as the last big enlargement round has had a huge impact on the GDPR and how it looks like today. Because countries like Poland, also the Czech Republic, um, are countries in the European Union where the uh, value of protecting private data, protecting privacy, uh, was very important. So we might have forgotten about it that Poland has played such a um, strict and, and strong role here, but this was the case. And I'd like to say this here because the enlargement is not something that is static or you should not only look at the enlargement um, because of the uh, domestic market. It also has an impact on the further development of the European Union and how it develops further. So apart from the reform of treaties and the framework in which Europe can act, um, the question who is Europe is also very important and how can we broaden the basis for Europe. This is also a central, a central issue and this is um, something that we are faced with. So how should reform or how should the enlargement in Europe proceed? And I'm convinced that it needs to proceed. There are enough reasons for it, not only the current situation with the war against um, Ukraine and also our knowledge that we sh should have a much broader interest in enhancing our security architecture and also to strengthen the basis, security basis in Eastern Europe, but also the challenges that we currently see in view of a huge need for investment in infrastructure into the future of our economies. 
um, challenges like the like climate change or also the long-term stability of our security architecture all these are issues where we need to invest we need funding for it and also the cohesion and also the social framework conditions uh, in Europe for all this we need a new fundament a new basis and this will only be possible when we also discuss a deepening of the European Union and it will only be possible in connection with the necessary steps towards enlargement. All this is connected and we will discuss this tonight. And I'm quite happy that you are all here. I think it's very important to keep in mind, especially ahead of such an election, that it's very difficult at times to uh, break down these very complex issues to the impact on the individual citizen and um, the citizens in, in Europe. So it, our focus today will also be to convey this. What does it mean for the population in Europe, the people who are supposed to go to the polls? And I hope that we can answer these questions here on the panel. But at the end, uh, you will also have the opportunity in the Q&A session to ask questions um, and to go into more detail in with regard to one or the other issue, or maybe also afterwards when we have a few drinks here in the building downstairs. And without further ado, I would like to invite our guests here to the panel. And I have to look at my notes here. We have Dr. Tu Nguyen with us. She comes from the Jacques Delors Center here in Berlin. And she studied at the Maastricht University on uh, constitutional law of the European Union, which is an area uh, which uh, I know well. I also worked as an institute for European constitutional law. And she was also a member of the Franco-German expert group for the EU reforms. And now she's at the Jacques Delors Center, responsible for the institutional issues. Uh, so welcome here to this uh, panel. And you can come to the stage now. <laughs> you can choose your seat. The second person I would like to welcome here is Piotr Buras. He is the head of the Warsaw Office of the European Council on Foreign Relations. And in this connection, he's also a senior policy fellow, fellow as the ECFR, which is the abbreviation. And his focus is the German EU and foreign policy, Poland within the EU, and also EU politics. He's also a journalist and has also worked for the um, Gazeta Wyborcza. Welcome to you as well. And I will take a seat in the middle now. Well, I'm quite happy to welcome both of you here today. I already mentioned a few things, so this is why I do not want to summarize here, but start with the first question, which is the question when it comes to the topic of reform and enlargement of the EU, do we have a hen egg problem? I mean, this has come up time and again, and many people see this and hear it. First, we have to deepen the EU before we can take in more members, for example. And then suddenly we realized, oh, we have to be quicker when it comes to the enlargement um, and maybe postpone the reforms. So how can we get out of this hen-egg uh, conundrum? Um, or does it have to be that way? Or is is there really a difficult connection, or is it sometimes just a pretext? Maybe we can start with you. Well, I'm happy to uh, reply to that. I would say that enlargement and reform are two sides of the same coin. These are aspects, two aspects that need to be thought together and should be thought together. We should enlarge, but in parallel, we also have to tackle reforms. And of course, there was the debate about reforms time and again from different actors, also most recently. But what we have seen is that uh, it was first the enlargement which actually accelerated the debate about reforms. We had the conference on Europe and different proposals from the European Parliament. So it came up time and again, but the necessary push 
was the enlargement question, which has become a priority once again. So I would say that these two topics belong together and they are both on the table at the moment. I think without the enlargement question, we would not be there where we are in terms of reforms. But in order to enlarge, we also need reforms. So I would say these are two connected issues. It's not a hen-egg thing, but two parallel processes that need to be thought together. Well, in very acute areas like the foreign and security policy, it's quite obvious that we have to make progress with our reforms. So is it possible at all to do this together with an enlargement? Shouldn't, I mean, don't we run the risk to block ourselves uh, by doing so? Well, I might have a slightly different view on this question. So maybe it reflects a little bit the thinking in Poland, in a country which, irrespective of the fact that we have a new government, is still a little bit skeptical when it comes to the reform debate. I would say um, that uh, the two debates are connected, as we've just heard, by two, and also historically. Um, I mean, in the uh, eastward enlargement round, we also had a new treaty, and um, so we had a deepening of the European integration. But at the same time, we have to ask the following question. First of all, what kind of reforms do we actually need in order to enlarge the European Union? And this brings me back to your question of foreign policy. And secondly, we also have to see that there are also countries who are fundamentally convinced that the European Union needs fundamental reforms in the institutional realm or also in the policy realm, uh, the EU budget or a competition policy or in other areas. And there are also countries who are against it. And I think in the debate that we are currently seeing is that there are countries which attribute much more importance to the enlargement, and there are also others who want to seize the opportunity of the enlargement debate in order to make progress in the reform debate, this other realm. And I think there is this field of tension. Of course, the two debates belong together, but um, and but we can uh, also take your question in order to uh, investigate whether this argument is really um, a fitting argument, um, whether we should change the voting procedures, for example. So formally speaking, we don't have to do it. The treaty that we have today is sufficient in order to integrate new members, so there's new formal requirement to conduct institutional reforms, but whether the EU will be able to act or live with unanimity in foreign and security issues, I'm quite divided when it comes to this question. Well, I would um, fully agree if we have more countries who have the right to veto certain decisions, then we also have more veto possibilities. But we already have 27 members. And um, very often we come to um, decisions, to an agreement in many questions. It's very complicated very often. This is a problem. I admit, and I myself are always a little bit annoyed to see how Viktor Orban acts in the council. But at the same time, we have to say there is only one thing that is worse that a European Union that cannot take a decision, which is a European Union which takes a decision but does not implement or cannot implement the decision. And this is something that happened several times, also because of my own country. For example, when it comes to the issue of migration, there was the decision in 2015 on the distribution of migrants, uh, of refugees, 
across Europe, and this is also the basis of the um, treaty. Uh, Poland, Hungary, and other countries have uh, doubted, had questioned this legal basis. However, the European Court of Justice has rejected that. So it was absolutely legal, a legal decision, which was taken by qualified majority. And then the countries have simply ignored this decision. They have not implemented it. They rejected it. And nothing happened. The European Court of Justice said this was not lawful, but so you also have to ask the practical question, right? To what extent, how far can you go with respect to the simplification of decision making? Now, with a view to the countries that are supposed to join us, we also see that there are a number of challenges, like Ukraine, for example, which is a country that wants to join and might also join. It would be the second biggest member state with about 30 million inhabitants and also in terms of its surface, its territory, it's one of the biggest. And this is clearly going to change the European Union. Also, with a view to the agricultural policy of the EU, which is an important sector. So how will we deal with these challenges? And what about the other countries that are in question here? Well, certainly an enlargement would change the European Union. And we must distinguish between one big country like Ukraine and many other smaller countries. And the impact will be different if many small countries will join. You have more veto players in the EU if a big country becomes a member, you will also have an impact on the European Parliament. So it makes a difference depending on which country will join. But certainly the EU will be different from what it is today with 10 new members and powers will also be shifted in a different way. And it also make a difference in terms of its geography. It's expanding towards the east. It's also going to have a financial impact. There are lots of countries which are poorer than the European average who will join some of the reports and forecasts and calculations. Let us assume that the enlargement will bring a major burden to the EU. Some of these reports are exaggerated, but it's clearly going to have an impact. However, the EU has its mechanisms in order to deal with the enlargement. So it's not going to ask too much from the budget because there will be mechanisms in order to deal with an extra demand. And there are a number of calculations also with respect to what current member states will lose in terms of EU money. So yes, the enlargement will have an impact, but the EU also has its mechanisms in order to deal with these uh, with this enlargement and it will certainly be capable of mitigation and a major question is of course the question of reforms we will have to look at the council we will have to look at the commission we will have to look at the parliament all these are political players and these are political activities which need to be discussed also simultaneously i.e within this process of enlargement but of course, the EU also can control what is going to happen. Now, you mentioned the costs, the costs of the enlargement. And yet, we also get something. It's not only about paying. 
it's also about getting something. We, the Europeans, but also the new member states, what are the benefits of the enlargement? Could we also say this with a view to the last Eastern enlargement? I mean, what about the costs we have to bear without an enlargement? It would be interesting to look back and look ahead, right? I think that's actually a question which has not been discussed sufficiently in the public. What are the costs of the non-enlargement, i.e., what do we have to pay if we don't enlarge or expand the EU, and how does the EU as a whole benefit from the new member states? Now, from the Polish perspective, it's evident that Poland was a major um, party to benefit from the enlargement. I could give you numbers. The um, Polish GSP is but one example. So I could give you lots of economic data, financial data, but that's not the most important aspect. It's even more important to look at the current candidate countries and the new member states. And it's also important to look at their perspective because they have embarked on a process of economic transformation. And this has an impact on the security policy for Europe as a whole. We could easily imagine what Central and Eastern Europe would look looked like if we hadn't an enlargement or if we hadn't had an enlargement in the past. But this is clearly an aspect which is often overlooked in Germany, in France, and in other countries. So people do not really talk about the benefits we have in and because of an enlargement. I mean, look at Ukraine in Poland. People are talking about the imports of Ukrainian products and they block the borders. And this is again about the costs. So people are looking at the negative sides first and foremost. But in the Polish society and in economic circles, people are also underlining or beginning to understand that Poland is not a black box. It's not in the national interest to go and close the borders and to only import national goods. There are different players and different aspects to be seen. And there are certainly a number of sectors that will benefit from an EU enlargement and the integration of Ukraine. And the same goes, by the way, for Europe as a whole. For the whole European Union, consumers will certainly benefit because food will be cheaper. Since not all of us are peasants or farmers or in the food manufacturing industry, so we'd certainly benefit the opening of the market also implies major opportunities. So there are lots of things that happened, good things that happened after the Eastern enlargement of the EU. And it's hard to imagine the German economy today without Poland or the Czech Republic or Hungary. It would be a disaster if we hadn't the trade with those countries and the investment opportunities. I mean, people are talking about a crisis of the German economic model, but this crisis would have happened 20 years earlier without an Eastern expansion of the EU. So this should be a lesson to be learned. So when we talk about the cost 
on a cost benefit of the EU enlargement, we have to be a bit more differentiated. And we should not only look at the numbers with respect to the EU budget and the costs to be borne by the EU today. It doesn't make sense to talk about those costs only 18 or 19, according to the most credible estimates, 18 or 19 billion euros per year is the cost of an enlargement with the integration of Ukraine. This is a minor, a minimum share, maybe one or two percent of the overall EU budget. So this is not an expense that could be considered remarkable at all. It's a minor expenditure. And most probably it will even be much less anyway. So I'm planning here for a much more differentiated view. Right. But in addition to the question of the costs and the potential gains you get, there are a number of prerequisites, conditions that need to be fulfilled in order to have the accession countries become members, Georgia, Moldova, the Balkan states, and in many of those states, the conditions have not yet been fulfilled. So what is the timeline we are looking at here? I mean, what do the countries have to deliver? The situation has changed a bit in the last few years. And there are a number of countries which have to fulfill the criteria. So what are the criteria today and what is the timeline? Before I answer this question, I would like to follow up on what Piotr just said. Because it's true, there are benefits of the enlargement too. And right now we are also looking at the geopolitical situation when talking about the um, enlargement. This is about neutrality and strategic questions and the war. Just after the beginning of the war, Ukraine asked to become a member of the EU and the EU was quite quick in dealing with this particular application. So we also need to look at action and non-action in this respect. So what could happen if we don't go and stabilize our neighborhood? What about the pressure exercised by Russia, by China? We need to see the overall geopolitical political picture. And we need to also ask how big the EU needs to be in order to have a standing in the world. So there is a geopolitical political necessity the EU needs to enlarge quickly. But it's also true that the process is a difficult one. It's a lengthy one. There are lots of criteria which need to be fulfilled, like the Copenhagen um, criteria, political stability, a working market economy, and the implementation of the European laws. and. There are lots of laws. So this is a long, long process, and there are a number of challenges involved here. So this is what we need to be see what we need to see in the context of this enlargement process. We do have criteria, we have certain chapters, and within a certain chapter, a country that applies for a membership has to fulfill its criteria. And then the Commission decides. So this is a clearly defined political process which sometimes takes 20 years or more. So with a view to the future, well, it's difficult to anticipate what the future will bring. Thus, your question about the timeline is difficult to answer because it always depends on what a country can offer and to what extent a country can fulfill the criteria. We do have the 2030 process, and we have also inscribed this process in the group, but not with respect to the timeline and the enlargement, but with respect to the question, 
when the EU should be willing and prepared and ready to enlarge. I think it's a long-term process. So now you already pointed to the Commission where you participated in. I think the two European states, Ministers Anna Lehmann and Laurence Bohn, uh, the Franco-German expert uh, group, they connected the target 2030 with the statement, when should European, Europe be ready to uh, be enlarged? So does this basically mean that the reform and the deepening of the EU needs to be concluded before these countries can join? Is this basically a prerequisite? I mean, in fact, it's taking place in parallel, but is it connected to your statement? Yes, in our report it is connected. We say that the EU needs to undergo reforms. Both processes need to go hand in hand, but before new member states uh, become members, we need to conclude the reforms in order to pre be prepared. So what are the reforms that it is about? Maybe you can give us some insights into the paper and make clear what are actually the aspects that need to be concluded, that need to be solved maybe, uh, before such enlargement can take place. But from my point of view, these are predominantly three areas. And one point has to be uh, singled out as the most important one in our report, which is the rule of law. How can we guarantee rule of law in the EU and how can we make sure that it is guaranteed also when we have more than 27 member states? How can we protect our values? And we do see currently that there are huge difficulties with some member states. I mean, one member state is now almost back on track, but it's not that easy. So even if the political situation changes, it is not that easy to come back to um, rule of law. Hungary, of course, remains a problem. And this is a very important question. How can we protect rule of law in the enlargement process, which is a little bit easier because the EU lever is very strong as long as the um, prospective members are not yet members. And the second question is, how can we strengthen EU instruments in a way so that we can protect it in the future, even with more member states? And in our report, rule of law actually was given um, individual chapter because we say it's so fundamental for the functioning of the European Union, the single market for the EU as a whole, that we cannot consider it one of five EU reform chapters, um, but it is an individual chapter ahead of all the others. And of course, the other huge issue is the capability to act of the EU. How can the EU take decisions with up to 36 or 37 member states? And Piotr has already mentioned it. Above all, it is about the veto or the qualified majority vote. So this is one area which is quite controversial. Should we enhance the possibility for a qualified majority vote? Our recommendation is as such. We want to enhance it. And it is part of most uh, poli political fields, but not in the foreign and security policy, for example, or when it comes to treaty changes. No, we, when it comes to treaty changes, we said only political decisions, but not the constitutional decisions, so to speak. And of course, there are also qualified majority decisions in most areas. But where we have a qualified majority vote, we tend to um, try to reach a consensus usually. So sometimes it does not work out, but um, all in all, the EU is really a consensus-oriented organization, uh, if I can put it like that. But at the same time, we know how difficult the question is. And from a German and French perspective, it's easy to say, well, let's introduce qualified majority votes. We are huge countries with many votes or a big voting share, but we talked also to members from other countries and made proposals how the impact on smaller countries could be mitigated. Um, veto and qualified majority votes, of course, are not binary. They are not connected. Of course, if we try to touch upon it, we can also try to alter the calculation based on which the qualified majority vote is uh, calculated. So we can come to calculations which are more beneficial to smaller countries. So I mean, if we would touch upon the treaties, 
um, then this would create a little more leeway. And the third area, which I consider very important, is the budget issue. So what do we do with the EU budget? Not only with regard to the enlargement, of course, it will be a challenge here, and we already touched upon that. The new member states need to be integrated, but enlargement is not only the only challenge that the EU is faced with. So, I mean, we're talking about climate issues, industry policy, uh, security issues, and all these uh, issues are basically coming down to the question, how can we fund it? And how can we fund it also with regard to the reconstruction fund, which was set up during the pandemic and which will phase out in 2026? So we know that it will um, end in two years from now, but we see more and more areas which need to be funded, which need investment, and next year maybe already the enlargement. So um, I think this is also a very big chunk, so to speak, a big area that we need to talk about, not in terms only in terms of uh, the institutions, but also the uh, policies, for example, the agricultural policy. And you also touched upon uh, the Ukraine and also the cohesion policy. And the, it's the question of distribution. I mean, we made more recommendations, but these are basically the three areas which are most pressing, I would say. Well, I would like to uh, go over to Piotr now, um, also with the question of the uh, change of perspective, because this is a commission proposal from a Franco-German perspective. And uh, of course, nowadays, people are more looking towards the Weimar Triangle um, and trying to include the perspective of the new Polish government. But it would also be great to hear from Poland or um, also maybe if you know voices from the Baltic states. So what's the their take or your take on these reform uh, proposals and what is actually needed? Well, we have quite a skeptical um, perspective here for different reasons. One reason is that in this striving for uh, an institutional reform, this is usually considered as an attempt to postpone the enlargement of the EU. And of course, I do agree to two that these two processes need to be thought together. But we have to be quite clear about the message that we send out also to the um, applicant states, the candidate states. I mean, this is a merit-based process, of course. Uh, so if you conduct the reforms, then you are entitled to become a member of the European Union. But, of course, based on the precondition that we have conducted our reforms, the necessary reforms, and many of the reforms that you have spoken of, not many, but some, require a reform of the treaties. In order to reform an EU um, treaty, um, all the member states have to come to an agreement, including Hungary, and the new treaty then needs to be ratified in all the countries. Um, and in some countries, you even have to uh, hold a referendum. So it's quite a lengthy process. And in this regard, I might not be not come to an agreement with two here. Um, I do not see the EU conclude a new uh, treaty over the next year so that an accession would be possible in 2030. So it would be absolutely optimistic, I would say. I think the the atmosphere, the mood is quite different. Uh, just imagine a vote in um, France or Germany or Austria or Poland. I think a constitutional treaty um, uh, reform will not come. And this brings me back to the question, what kind of message are we going to send out to the candidates countries? I think this is an important question because we've seen it in the Balkans already, how frustrated these countries, the societies there were when it comes to the enlargement process. The um, 
people in Macedonia. The positive attitude towards Europe and European accession has changed completely. So in all these countries, Albania um, and um, Bosnia, Herzegovina and others, they do not expect um, a quick accession anymore. Of course, they undertake reforms, but we can no longer promise them that as soon as they have done all that, they will become members because we might not be prepared to take them in at that point of time. And this is really a vicious circle. But when we now say, um, okay, we will eventually reform the EU and then you will be able to become a member, then I, I'm afraid I think we might achieve the opposite of what we want to achieve. I mean, I put it like that now, but of course I have to say I'm not against reforms. But we should focus on the reforms that are below the level of a treaty reform, I would say. And we should focus on reforms, for example, that can be connected to the enlargement in a way that uh, to um, expert group has also proposed. So in the um, treaties, we can um, anchor reforms. So as soon as the first country exceeds the EU, these reforms would be implemented automatically. I do think that this um, perspective that I have represented here is important because we already run the risk that we might lose out the momentum and the enlargement debate. I think already now there is some kind of fatigue. I mean, we are talking about the European elections, the upcoming European elections, and there's a huge fear in the political elites that the accession of the EU to Europe might become a topic in the electoral campaign. Of course, everyone wants to prevent that. Um, Ursula von der Leyen, for example, has said a few days ago that the negotiating mandate of the Commission for the negotiations with Ukraine might not be uh, um, started before the European elections. I think this is um, already a consequence of these fears to rather not touch upon these topics because uh, the citizens might be annoyed with that. Or not. So what needs to be done I mean, I just said what shouldn't be done. I mean, this is not uh, not really good approach, I would say. But um, now I would like to say what needs to be done. Um, Two has talked about this target date. And I think this is important. I know it's contentious. Many people are against it, that the European Union lays out an objective. But then the fact that the European Union says in 2030, we want to prepare to take a new members. And this is not um, this is not a promise that these countries will be taken in. Of course, they all have to undertake reforms. They need to be prepared. But this would rather be an objective for ourselves. So up until then, we should prepare ourselves. We have to um, implement the necessary reforms. And we promise that we are ready from our side by 2030. Of course, this would be a major leap for the European Union, but I think this would be politically important. This is one thing. And secondly, next year after the European elections, the discussions will surely start about the new EU budget. And the new EU budget, even um, the impact on the enlargement of the enlargement will not be that big yet, um, but we have to rethink the budget already. We have to think about the possibility that in 2030 or beyond that, there will be more member states and we have to prepare the EU budget for it. 
this is also very difficult. I know that all politicians will try to fight that, will be against it, but it's also our task as a think tank or as citizens who are in favor of the enlargement to urge uh, the politicians to do that because this is also part of our own preparations for the enlargement, of the EU's preparations for the enlargement. And it's also a signal to the candidate countries that we're really serious about it. So if we already start to prepare a budget for the enlargement, this really means and sends the signal that we really mean it and it's credible. But if we shy away from this debate and say, no, no, the next budget is up until 2034, but it does not make sense to discuss it now, so please let us postpone these discussions. Then, of course, this sends a completely different signal. This sends the signal that we are not serious about it. It's not credible. So, And yet, I need to come back to the reform. Because I am convinced that the Central and Eastern European member states cannot be interested in having a union that is incapable of action because they rely on infrastructure investments. And I want to be competitive also on an international scale. So there are certainly, there is certainly an interest in the capacity of action. So wouldn't it be possible to get support for reforms in the other member states or in other countries? Certainly, for sure. I mean, that's the question of the debate about the reform. I mean, what are we talking about? Is it just about um, voting or what? Right. I mean, it doesn't make sense to just talk about proceedings, processes, and procedures. Exactly. We, we need to focus on policies. I, I'm very much convinced of the validity of the debate, like a debate about the market, a viable market in Poland. In Poland, people often talk about the competition rules of the EU, and they ask about public subsidies in this respect. These are very popular items on the agenda, and I mean, after the pandemic, the rules of the past have been softened. And also after the Russian war in order to revitalize the economy and in order to get support to enterprises, France and Germany, however, are the most powerful and the strongest economies in Europe. And they pay much more in terms of subsidies than others, Poland couldn't pay this, and other countries couldn't either. And that's, of course, an aspect which is often criticized in the countries who pay a lot, and especially in the countries which don't have the same fiscal opportunities. Now, let's get back to the voting mechanisms. In Germany, they talk about the voting rep uh, mechanisms and they say these should be changed. But this happens in a situation in which Germany has a lot of influence in the EU, and after the Brexit, the smaller countries even lost their influence or part of their influence. Now, if we talk about subsidies and support, it's difficult to argue in Poland, that we have to take more and more majority decisions. Because critics will come and say Germany will benefit. So is there an increasing lack of trust or mistrust even? Like 
people think that the big countries will benefit and the small will suffer and be the losers. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, and the uh, situation I've described is also used by political forces. There are also those who want to weaken Europe instead of making it stronger. And they go and say, this is an excellent example to show how the EU works, like the hegemonic power of Germany and France. And you have it. And then Tusk, the Polish premier, goes and says, I need to argue. And he doesn't want to even embark on that debate. Which brings me to the question of the bridge. I mean, do we have to build a bridge for Tusk and others so that things can really change within the EU, so that reforms can happen, like a joint investment package? Also, as a follow-up to Next Generation EU or other programs, a bit like what the USA did. So do you think that this will be offered by Germany and France in the future or increasingly? Or do we need a more active intervention? I would like to briefly comment on the question of reform or enlargement. Of course, we can do see the reform as a kind of secret enlargement process. But we could also go and say the EU takes the enlargement serious. They are serious about enlarging the union. And if this is the case, the question is, of course, how do we prepare for it? Does the EU really prepare for an enlargement at the end of the next period? So we can also go and adopt a positive stance here and see things in a positive light. Because this might also imply the question to ourselves, are we willing to accept others and are we preparing for it? Now, in order to answer your current question, there is still a lot of possibility to improve, I'd say. Right now, the government is very much looking at itself. So. They are not looking at Europe. There are exceptions, like the state minister, the under secretary of state, who commissioned the report we have just made. She is looking at the outside, but everybody else, or many others, are just focusing on Germany, the question how Germany votes in Brussels, whether Germany is a reliable partner. And also the question of the coordination between Germany and its European partners. I'd say there is a lot of frustration, not only in Brussels, but also in the other member states. And this needs to be seen also in Berlin. So do we have to say that the chance to implement a reform by the year 2030 also depends on the German government and its policy today, its EU policy today? Well, of course, it's also depending on the current government. Germany is a big country. It's an influential country. So if there was a campaign of the German and French government, 
it would be good. But in the end, at the end of the day, you have to have all member states involved and on board. And these debates have to take place on a pan-European scale. And there needs to be a solution which can be accepted by all member states, not only by the French and German side. It's good to have them get going, but it does not really help as much if all the others opt out, especially since there is this lack of trust. And the rest of Europe has the impression that Germany does policy, but in its very own interest only. Yeah, I think the debate about subsidies hasn't helped much either. So, do reforms help is the question. I think it's important that Germany adopts a stance here and moves in this direction, which is not happening in spite of the fact that the German government is very much in favor of the enlargement of the EU. The German government has been very open and outspoken with respect to the enlargement, very different from other topics. Just briefly, if I may. Because you asked whether it's also up to the German government whether the reform will work. I think we have to see the whole debate in a much bigger context. The geopolitical situation has made us talk about this topic in the first place without the war in Ukraine, we wouldn't have this debate at all. The enlargement topic was uh, gone, has been dead for years. So that's what we need to see. And we thus need to see also that the future of the EU and the EU enlargement and the reform will be decided here, maybe. The integration of Ukraine and the EU enlargement is currently an important element of a potential solution in this war. So without the European perspective, Ukraine is not credible. So the credibility of the EU is in question here, too. There must be the willingness of the EU to integrate Ukraine. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to find a solution. Many people in Germany and elsewhere would like to see peace or a settlement, a solution, a truce, whatever. And that's what, what we see today. And we know that it's difficult for Ukraine to reconquer its territories. The perspective for the next months is not a, an optimistic one, not at all. So there will only be a truce if Ukraine becomes part of the West, even if it cannot get its lost territories back, they could win the war because of the EU perspective and because of the NATO perspective, which is why well, it's important to not forget about this particular strategic goal. Because otherwise we lose ourselves in a debate about technicalities. 
Well, we, we had our foreign policy conference here a few weeks ago, and we talked about the same question. And this is to be seen also against the backdrop of what we are seeing these days on a global scale. I'm just back from the United States, and there is an upcoming presidential election. And no matter what will be the result, the Senate will not have a majority for more investments. So Europe has to adopt this question and get going also with respect to Ukraine, which raises the question time and again whether the EU is capable of doing this. I mean, the nuclear deterrent of the EU, that's what people talk about. But irrespective of the quite naive stance some people have in this respect, we have to talk about alliances. I mean, can there be alliances beyond the European Union? And which role can the EU play? on a European uh, scale. So what role does it play? Well, I think it's quite interesting because no matter what scenario you're imagining, with or without Trump, um, a positive scenario in the war between Russia and the West and Ukraine, or a negative one, we always come to the same conclusion. The European Union, the EU member states, have to invest much more in their defense. They have to ramp up the um, arms production. They have to create a credible deterrence. And it's, it doesn't matter what kind of scenario we are faced with what eventually comes true. I mean, we tend to talk a lot about um, Trump 2.0, Trump's return to the White House, and how tragic it would be. And of course, I fully agree. I mean, the question whether the European Union is capable of finding its position in such a scenario, I would say no, not yet. I mean, we are not yet prepared for such a scenario. But um, I would like to stop thinking in these black and white categories. We simply have to do what is missing at the moment. I already mentioned it. It will be difficult. Also, when it comes to the timeline, it's difficult to imagine that uh, up until January 2025, we are already in a situation, in a position where we can say, OK, we can now rely on ourselves and everything is great. But I would uh, rather say, I mean, if we did that, then we could also be in a different position towards the Trump administration and say, well, let's talk now. We have certain arguments at our hand. And the transactional approach of Trump might eventually also be an opportunity for us. But we have to come to, to a deal. We have to be prepared for such a deal, rather. We have to be prepared to say, OK, we are already on a good track. We will take care of our regional um, security, let's put it like that, in our immediate neighborhood. And eventually, we will reach this stage. But what we expect from the Americans is that <coughs> They remain the European nuclear power, so to speak. And whether we succeed, whether Trump might agree to such a deal, nobody knows. But even if not, we have no other choice than going towards this direction. Well, we actually had envisioned now uh, to include the audience here, but I still have two short questions which are quite important to me. On the one hand, um, we talk a lot about uh, this huge need for investment and huge steps that need to be taken where 
um, coming to an agreement and also unanimity will be extremely difficult to reach. And one of your proposals is also to reduce the veto possibilities. But if we do not manage to reduce the possibilities for a veto or to convince everyone or maybe even to decide uh, certain aspects in a qualified majority, the treaty still stipulates that in parts of the European Union, meaning uh, in several member states, we can make progress uh, together, so in smaller groups. So how likely is it that this is going to be the result? And is this even desired also in view of the fact that this would also create distrust of those who do not participate in these smaller groups? I think this is a scenario which uh, needs to be thought through. How differentiated will the European Union will, uh, be in the future and how differentiated will be a bigger European Union. Can we make progress with all member states um, in a similar way? And this is also a scenario that we've played through in the report, which was not really our favorite scenario because um, this would mean that some member states are no longer um, key member states. Well, this is the talk about the concentric circles. Well, I mean, we have to say this does not reflect anything that's not yet there. I mean, we do have the Eurozone, zone, which is integrated. We have Schengen, for example, and not with all member states. We already have something, uh, the European um, policy group, which is realized. But the thing, the question now is uh, how differentiated do we want the EU to become. I mean, this is just a means to achieve our objectives. So if our objectives are so important that we have to do it, and the idea is that the member states that are not yet participating will eventually participate. I mean, um, the Eurozone, of course, is meant to be open for everyone. And I mean, this is the currency for the EU. So I would say differentiation is a um, means and end um, I mean, it, it's a means that we can make use of, but this should not be the end. But of course, we also need countries here that are going into the same direction. And I could hardly imagine a core Europe without France and Germany. And um, France and uh, Germany should uh, come to an agreement on the main uh, issues here. I mean, this is, the political dimension is very important here because theoretically, of course, we can always envision a differentiated Europe. But from a practical point of view, I do not really see it. Well, different. And last question to the panelists, which is also a look into the crystal ball at this point. I mean, we are having this discussion ahead of the European elections. We will see elections to the European Parliament soon. And we all are entitled and to co-determine where the European Parliament or Europe will uh, go to and go forward. But we're doing it at a time where the fears are enormous that uh, majorities in the European Parliament might end up quite differently from what we've seen over the past decade, for example. So how likely is it that we can make any step towards reform and enlargement if, for example, um, we see a further shift to the right in the European Parliament after the elections, uh, let alone the question of what might happen during the next French election? So looking at your experience in Poland recently, so how high is the risk that we don't see anything happen at all? eventually. I think there's a huge risk with regard to the EU reforms and also the enlargement and also when it comes to other important um, issues of the European Union like the European Green Deal. I mean, I can do a little advertisement that has been published recently on the European elections and it includes very detailed analyses on the possible composition of the European uh, Parliament with the thesis that there is a shift to the right and that the three mainstream parties, which is the Christian Democrats or Conservatives and the Liberals and also the Socialists, they would reach approximately uh, only 55 percent of the Parliament but would still have a majority. But 
the right wing and populist parties would um, be increasingly important and the policy impact is it will have some consequences for certain political f areas. So the authors have explained quite in detail how specific political parties have voted, for example, on the issue of migration or the Green Deal. And they came to the conclusion that with the new composition of the parliament, possible composition of the parliament, some uh, legislative uh, issues could not be implemented. I mean, they did not talk specifically about the enlargement because the enlargement is a very complex issue. But um, I mean, this is not a concrete law where you simply have to agree or reject. Um, but I think that we have actually reached a point or we will reach a point where the pro-European mainstream majority will still be there. But in some very important and sensitive political areas, it will be very difficult to reach a majority. Well, until we can see that eventually it is about every single vote to the European Parliament um, in order to determine which direction the European Parliament um, should go to. And of course, at least it's, it can have a mobilizing effect. Um, I'm now looking into the room. I'm looking at the audience. Are there any questions or comments? So please, um, the mic is coming to you. We can start with you. And after your question, you can hand over the mic to the next yeah, person. Thank you very much, Julika Halt. My name I'm a student at the Heritage School. I'm also working at the Ministry for uh, Labour and Social Affairs on the EU enlargement. One question to two. Uh, you earlier said that um, especially rule of law and the reforms there is very important. So I would like to know, would a change in the treaty be necessary for it? For example, if you think of an accession of Serbia, for example, this might be a good example which shows that it's very relevant and very important. And my other question is more referring to the enlargement fatigue and what should be changed or needs to be changed. I mean, it has already been mentioned, um, timeline of uh, 20 years. So Macedonia is still waiting for 20 years uh, now since its first um, uh, attempt. And when the accession it was successful, I think we have already seen figures that um, we need eight, but eight times as much funding, and we've seen it with the example of Poland, for example. <clears throat> so much more money would flow into the direction of the new members in order, for example, to prevent any negative feelings or resentment amongst the population, for example, in this case in the Balkans towards the EU because it's simply not quick enough and uh, things are difficult to implement. So thank you very much for your questions and you can hand over the mic towards the gentleman behind you. Um, but first of all, I'd like to give the floor, um, give the question to the floor. So rule of law and do we need an adaptation here in the process um, and also the idea that Already during the um, negotiation process, um, do we have to increase the funding for that? Well, two very good questions. Regarding the rule of law, in our report, we have laid out different options, which where we do need a change in the treaty, but also below the level of treaty amendments, because we know definitely how difficult it is to amend the treaties. But our ideal is that we strengthen the budget conditionality and the Article 7 procedure. The first thing would need a change in the treaty, and the second depends on how you design it. I mean, there are possibilities uh, to change it within the realm of the treaty. Um, and the second question in terms of the funding, I mean, uh, already before the accession, uh, money is flowing to the Canada countries. So this is something that's already existent. And um, also when you look at the costs and the impact for the budget, we can see the effect here. This is no longer the 
free accession finance, I think it is called, or what's it called? Okay, pre-accession finance thing, and then the contributions. Maybe a brief word on the European elections. I mean, the elections are extremely important because the parliament currently has a very progressive uh, voice, is a progressive actor at the moment. In the, at the EU level when it comes to reforms, but also when it comes to migration and climate. But what we should not underestimate are the national elections. I think there are six upcoming national elections which also will have an impact on the European Council, Council and the Commission composition. Because when they take place before the European elections, I think it's the European elections, then the US election, but also the national elections. Um, and all three elections will have a huge impact on the next um, political years in Europe. This is a very important aspect that we will take along now. Now the gentleman behind you, and then you can give the mic to the others. Two questions, and I don't really care who answers them. One question is about pessimistic perspective with respect to the failing failure of um, the reform. And yet there will be an enlargement. How will they deal with smaller member states? Will it be possible to have bilateral agreements, for example, like as long as there is no reform, there can't be a veto. So smaller states can become member states, but there is no veto right for them. And the second question is about the mood, uh, especially in the anti-establishment parties, especially with respect to the loss of sovereignty, because they, they go and say, we will lose sovereignty if unanimity is no longer necessary. Michaela Schreier is my name. From 1999 to 2004, I was in charge of the European budget. So that was the time of the EU enlargement. And the financial framework that has been, that had been adopted by the member states only pertained to the ex expansion of six new member states without their right to use the agricultural subsidy fund, which was not just, not fair, and which was also a major challenge because this was actually a framework adopted for eight member states, eight new member, six new member states, and now there were eight. But Yes, there are some mechanisms, and you can juggle a bit also with the date of the accession. And if the mechanisms are not sufficient, the Commission needs to invent new ones. And that's its task. I would like to also comment on the Commission and the subsidies again with respect to some powerful, economically powerful member states which could do without. I mean, the Commission can decide whether they grant subsidies or whether they see it as an influencing of the competition, but usually the Commission tries to adopt a consensus decision, but they can also vote on it, and the majority wins. Thus, it's very important that the member states send one or two members to the Commission and the European Parliament. So far, always try to make sure that no member state delegates someone to the Commission who does not subscribe to the overall goal of intensifying the integration of the EU. And this is a decision taken 
by the majority of the commission, and thus I do rely on the commission. So even if you do see a shift in the parliament, this very task will be taken seriously because the commission is the institution that has the right of initiative and decides about the future path of the EU. Piotr, would you want to comment on the veto right of smaller states? I mean, the accession as such has to be a unanimous decision. So it would not be possible that an individual member state stops the whole process. But what about the veto right in, in general? Now, unanimity, as I said, bears risks. And I don't want to minimize them, but there are 27 member states, and it's not always easy to take a decision. But so far, we've managed to take decisions, even if they were difficult ones. This will probably not change if you have two, three, nine more member states. There is a balance within the EU, and new member states won't change that. I guess we'll have double standards eventually in the EU because of the particular status of the state. So I'm pessimistic and I am rather convinced that there won't be a consensus with respect to those rules within the EU, but there will be a consensus according to which we have to have those new member states. They have to become members. And the ones who think so will be the majority eventually. Maybe they will have to undergo a trial period, i.e. they might have to accept that for a certain period of time they have less rights. And maybe there will be standards that only apply to the new member states and not to the old ones. So there might be barriers or hurdles, so to speak, these new countries have to negotiate. This is not just, this is not fair. This might be criticized and there might even be countries that sue the EU at the European Court of Justice, but this is the most probable scenario, I'd say. No, we don't have much time left, so I would like to admit one last question. Thank you. We've just heard that the European debate, and especially in Germany, the debate is very much auto-focused, so to speak. What about Poland? That's my question for Piotr. Now, there have been major changes. I need to say the new government in Poland, which has been in office since uh, mid-December 2023, does not want to use European questions for domestic policy quarrels. So, they will, they will try and find solutions also on the EU level. This was not the case with the former government because it was a populist uh, government and as any populist government, they did not really want to focus on European policy or questions, but they wanted to instrumentalize the European situation or European policy. This 
is a major change, I'd say now. And we've also seen this also with respect to the minor um, triangle, where we try to have talks with the partners. I mean, this is a traditional format, right? This triangle. And it's uh, also reminding us of a cooperation between the Baltic states and the northern states. This is very different from Visegrad, right? The Baltic states are being seen as partners of Ukraine and in this and in other fields too, like in competition policy, they are on an equal playing field, so to speak, or on an equal level. And it's also interesting to see that there are fields where there has not been any change, like there where the Polish government adopts a very traditional position in migration in the field of migration policy, for example, the new government has not agreed to any of the proposals made by the Commission. However, they never found a majority. So they said we will vote against the draft proposals, the new bills proposed by the Commission. But if all the others agree to it, we will implement those rules and uh, regulations, which is another change between the current government and the government before. Before, there was a very restrictive rejection of the EU. Now, in the field of energy policy, there is not much movement, I have to say. There are EU reforms, yes. and. This more or less reflects the position of the government, which has an even more rigid position in this field. They don't want to have any reforms. And Ukraine, too. The new government is against the prolongation of the HGM, i.e. the liberalization of trade with Ukraine. Again, they won't find a majority. And the question is whether we will keep on the embargo, which we have adopted unilaterally. So this is quite interesting in terms of a continuity or the Europe friendliness of the new government. So not everything has changed dramatically, but some things have changed, which is due to the fact that the domestic policy context is a very difficult one. And this is what people tend to underestimate often. The victory of the pro-European force in the elections is often misinterpreted as a new wave of EU enthusiasm in Poland, but that's not the case. There are more and more skeptical voices, migration policy, climate policy, and the EU reform. These are three fields which are often used by populists to for their own vested interests. So the government is in a corner and can't really get out. And he does not really, it does not really want to get out. We'll see what will happen, happen after the European election. But there are presidential elections in Poland upcoming too after the European elections. Thank you, Piotr Burgas, also for giving us an insight into the current situation in Poland in view of the European connection and to when I would like to ask another question 
In view of the situation with respect to Europe and the election as a whole, because we have talked about a number of aspects also in terms of the technical dimension. But what about the citizens? Do they hear us? What do people think about this development? And do they think that a reform of the EU needs to happen? And how do they mobilize? How do you mobilize the people also in view of the elections and beyond? Yeah, well, that's going to be the big question. How do we reach out to the citizens? Right now, we might find answers on the political level. So in the next government period, we will have to make sure that the debate reaches out into society, which is also about sovereignty. I mean, how can we overcome this loss of sovereignty? We have to see the world we are living in. There is a war. Russia wages a war. Trump might be the next president. So can small nation states have a say, or do we need this bigger unit? Well, thank you very much for your answers. And I would like to remind you of the study of the European Council, also with respect to the European election. But I think it's also interesting to look at the report and the study dealing with the reform proposals of the Commission. These are two doc documents you should read. and. There is another study with the title Selbstverständlich Europäisch, which we will publish on 21st March. It's a study the Bell Foundation is publishing each and every year, and we are also looking at the overall mood and what people think about the current status of the European Commission. We will also have a conversation about energy policy Europe before the elections, this is going to happen on the 22nd of March. But I hope that we managed to give you an insight and you are welcome to stay with us for a drink and for a conversation with the experts who will be still around. Thank you very much. Good night.